Chapter 12. Sobbing in absolute misery, I threw myself onto my bed. I wept for Zachariah, for Cranach, even for Captain Jaggery. But most of all, I wept for myself. There was no way to avoid the truth that all the horror I'd witnessed had been brought about by me. As the ghastly scenes repeated themselves in my mind, I realized, too, that there was no way of denying what the captain had done. Captain Jaggery, my friend, my guardian, my father's employee, had been unspeakably cruel. Not only had he killed Kranik, who was, I knew, threatening him, he had clearly meant to kill Zachariah for no reason other than that he was helpless. He singled him out because he was the oldest and weakest. Or was it because he was black? Or was it, I asked myself suddenly, because he was my friend? Just the thought made me shiver convulsively. Tears of regret and guilt redoubled. My weeping lasted for the better part of an hour. Aside from reliving the fearsome events, I was trying desperately to decide what to do. As I grasped the situation, the crew would have nothing but loathing for me who had so betrayed them. And they were right. After their kindliness and acceptance, I had betrayed them. And Captain Jaggery? Without intending to, hadn't I done him a great wrong when I'd cut his face, albeit unintentionally, with the whip? Could he, would he, forgive me? Beyond all else, I had been educated to the belief that when I was wrong, and how often had my patient father found me at fault, it was my responsibility, mine alone, to admit my fault and make amends. Gradually then, I came to believe that no matter how distasteful, I must beg the captain's forgiveness. And the sooner I did so, the better. With this in mind, I rose up, brushed my hair, washed my face, smoothed my dress, rubbed my shoes. Then, as ready as I could ever hope to be under the circumstances, I went to his cabin door and knocked timidly. There was no answer. Again I knocked, perhaps a little more boldly. This time I heard, Who is it? Charlotte Doyle, sir. My words were met by an ominous silence, but after a while he said, What do you want? Please, sir, I beg you let me speak with you. When silence was again the response, I nearly accepted defeat and went away. But at last I heard steps within. Then came the word, Enter. I opened the door and looked in. Captain Jaggery was standing with his back to me. I remained at the threshold waiting for him to invite me to proceed further. He neither moved nor spoke. Sir? I tried. What? I... I did not mean... You did not mean what? I did not mean to interfere, I managed to say, now meekly advancing toward him. I was so frightened. I didn't know. I had no intention. When the captain maintained his silence, I faltered. But gathering up my strength again, I stammered, and when I had the whip... Suddenly, I realized he was about to turn. My words died on my lips. He did turn, and I saw him. The welt I made across his face was a red open wound. But it was his eyes that made me shudder. They expressed nothing so much as implacable hatred, and it was all directed at me. Sir, I tried, I did not mean- Do you know what you have done? His voice a hiss. Sir. Do you know? He now roared. My tears began to flow anew. I didn't mean to, sir, I pleaded. I didn't. Believe me. You insulted me before my crew as no man should ever be insulted. But- Insulted by a sniffling, self-centered, ugly, contemptible girl, he spat out, who deserves a horse whipping. I sank to my knees, hands in prayer-like supplication. Let them take care of you, he snarled. In any way they want, I withdraw my protection. Do you understand? I want nothing to do with you. Nothing! Sir, and don't you dare presume to come to my cabin again, he shouted. Ever! I began to weep uncontrollably. Get out, he raged. Get out! He made a move toward me. In great fright, I jumped up, tearing the hem of my dress, and fled back to my cabin. But if the truth be known, and I swore when I began to set down this tale that I would tell only the truth, even at that moment all my thoughts were of finding some way to appease the captain and regain his favor. If I could have found a way to gain his forgiveness, no matter what it took, I would have seized the opportunity. At this time, I did not cry. I was too numb, too much in a state of shock. Instead, I simply stood immobile. Rather like the moment when I'd first cast my eyes upon the Seahawk, trying confusedly to think out what I could do. I tried, desperately, to imagine what my father, even what my mother or Miss Weed, might want me to do, but I could find no answer. In search of a solution, I finally stepped in dread out of the cabin and made my way to the deck. I told myself that what I wanted, needed, was fresh air. In fact, I was motivated by a need to know how the crew would receive me. The ship was still adrift. No wind had caught our sails. The decks once more appeared deserted. My first thought was that the crew had fled. All I heard was the soft flutter of canvas, the clinking of chain, the heaving of boat timbers. It was as if the engines of the world itself had ground to a halt. But when I looked to the quarter deck, I did see the crew. Heads bowed, they were standing together quietly. Then I heard the deep voice of Fisk, though exactly what he was saying I could not at first make out. 
Hollabrass, I saw, was standing somewhat apart from the men, his dark eyes watching intently. There was a pistol in his hand, but in no way was he interfering with them. Timidly, I climbed the steps to the quarter deck for a better look. Now I realized that the crew was clustered around something. It looked to be a sack that lay upon the deck. On closer examination, I realized it was a canvas hammock such as the men slept in. This one was twisted around itself and had an odd, bulky shape. No one took notice of me as I stood by the forward rail. Gradually, I perceived that Fisk was saying a prayer. In a flash, I understood. The hammock was wrapped around a body, and that body had to be Zacharias. He had died of the beating. I had come upon his funeral. The men were about to commit his body to the sea. Fisk's prayer was not a long one, but he delivered it slowly, and what I heard of it was laced with bitterness, a calling on God to avenge them as they, poor sailors, could not avenge themselves. When Fisk had done, Ewig, Mr. Keach, Grimes, and Johnson bent over and picked the hammocks up. Hardly straining at the weight they bore, they advanced to the starboard railing, and then, emitting a kind of grunt in unison, they heaved their burden over. Seconds later, there was a splash followed by murmurs of, Amen. Amen. I shuddered. Fisk said a final short prayer. At last, they all turned about and saw me. I was unable to move. They were staring at me with what I could only take as loathing. I, I am sorry, was the best I could stammer. No one replied. The words drifted into the air and died. I didn't realize, I started to say, but could not finish. Tears were streaming from my eyes. I bowed my head and began to sob. Then I heard, Miss Doyle. I continued to cry, his countenance more fierce than usual. Go to the captain, he said brusquely. He is your friend. He's not, I got out between my sniffling. I want nothing to do with him. I hate him. Fisk lifted a fist, but let it drop with weariness. And I want to help you, I offered, to show how sorry I am. They merely stared. Please. I looked from him to the others. I saw no softening. Brokenhearted, I groped my way down to my cabin, pausing only to look upon the captain's closed door. Once alone, I again gave way to hot tears. Not only did I feel completely isolated, but something worse. I was certain that all the terrible events of the day, the death of two men, had been caused by me. Though I could find a reason for Kranich's death, I could hardly blame anyone but myself for the murder of Zachariah. It was I, despite clear warnings, who had refused to see Captain Jaggery as the villainous man he was, I, who had fired his terrible wrath by reporting to him Ewig's pistols, the round robin, and the stowaway. Yet my newfound knowledge brought me no help with my need to do something. I was still in my bed, it might have been an hour, when I heard the ship's bell begin to clang. Then came a cry from Mr. Hollerbrass. All hands! All hands! I sat up and listened. My first thought was that perhaps a wind had risen, that this was a call to trim the ship. Yet I heard none of the welcome sounds, the breaking waves, the hum of wind in the sails that would have come with a weather change. Then I thought that some new fearfulness was upon us. Alarmed, but unable to keep myself from curiosity, I slipped from my bed and cautiously opened my door. Once again, I heard the bell clanging in the cry, All hands! All hands! Increasingly apprehensive, I stole into the steerage, then poked my head out so I could see the deck. The crew stood in the waist of the ship, looking up. I crept forward. Captain Jaggery was clutching the quarterdeck rail so tightly his knuckles were white. The welt across his face had turned crimson. It caused me pain just to see it. Mr. Hollabrass was by his side. I meant what I said, I heard the captain say. Through your own folly, you've lost Zachariah, he continued. Not that he did much work. Not that any of you do. Mr. Fisk will assume Zachariah's duty in the galley. As for Mr. Keach, since he seems to prefer serving you rather than me, I place him in the forecastle where he will be more comfortable. The position of second mate, thus vacated, I give to Mr. Johnson. He, at least, has the dog's wit not to sign you round Robin. Mr. Johnson's position on his watch. You all will be responsible for that. I don't care how you do it, but each watch shall be filled with a full complement of four plus mate. These words, the last of which I did not understand, were met at first by stony silence. It was a moment or two later that Morgan stepped forward. Request permission to speak, sir. I think I had never before heard his voice. The captain turned slightly, glowered at the man, but nodded. Captain Jaggery, sir, Morgan called out. Nowhere is it written that a captain can require a man to work more than one watch, only in an emergency. The captain gazed at Morgan for a moment. Then he said, Very well, Mr. Morgan. Then I say it. This is an emergency. If these orders cause inconvenience, blame it on your darling Mr. Cranick, or the impertinence of Mr. Zachariah. And if you still have so much pity on these fools, you can work the extra shift yourself. So saying, he turned to Mr. Hollerbrass. Set the second watch to scrape the bow until a wind comes up. Dismiss the rest, he barked. 
Mr. Hollabrass turned to the crew and repeated the captain's commands. Without a word, the men backed off, some shuffling to the bow to work, others ducking below into the forecastle. All that remained on deck was the stain of Cranach's blood. Uncertainly, I made my way to the galley. Fisk was already there, his great bulk filling the small spaces Zachariah never had. I stood just beyond the entryway, hoping he would notice. When he didn't, I whispered, Mr. Fisk. He turned, but offered nothing more than a hostile glare. What did the captain mean, I asked, my voice small. Fisk continued to stare bleakly at me. Tell me, I pleaded, I have to know. The crew was short to begin with, he said. Now he's insulted me. Advanced Johnson, dumped Keech. All in all, it leaves us shorter than before. The captain intends to work us till we drop. Can I help in any way? You, Fisk said with incredulous scorn. He turned away. Mr. Fisk, you must believe me. I want to help. You are a lady passenger, Miss Doyle. The informer. My tears began to fall again. I had no idea. Now angry, he swung about. I find Miss Doyle mistaken. You did have an idea. You had it from Zachariah. I know you did. He told us he tried to convince you. Oh, Miss Doyle believes in honor, he'd say. She's the very soul of justice. Fisk spat on the floor. Honor. What you mean to say, Miss Doyle, is that you didn't choose to heed his words because Zachariah was an old black who lacked the captain's graces. I bowed my head. Can you cook, he growled. Reef sails? Turn the wheel? I think not, miss. So you'd do best keeping the place you have. When you reach Providence, you can walk off free, and I warrant you'll think no more on us. That's not true. Go to the captain, Miss Doyle. He's your darling master. Mr. Fisk, I begged, my voice as small as my pride. The captain will have nothing to do with me. No, he'll not forgive you so soon. Beware your friend, Miss Doyle. Beware him. He cut me off abruptly. Gentle folk like you never mean, Miss Doyle. But what you do... I could not bear it anymore. I retreated to my cabin. Once again, I gave myself up to guilt and remorse. That night, I remained in my cabin. I couldn't eat. Now again, I slept, but never for long. There were times I fell on my knees to pray for forgiveness. But it was from the crew as much as God that I sought pardon. If only I could make restitution. If only I could convince the men that I accepted my responsibility. Close to dawn, an idea began to form. At first, only an echo of something Fisk had said. But the mere thought of it was appalling, and I kept pushing it away. Yet again and again it flooded back, overwhelming all other notions. At last, I heaved myself off the bed, and from under it brought out the canvas seaman's garments Zachariah had made for me. Some roaches skittered away. I held the wrinkled clothing up and looked at its crude shape, its mean design. The feel of the crude cloth made me falter. I closed my eyes. My heart was beating painfully as if I were in some great danger. No, I could not. It was too awful. Yet I told myself I must accept responsibility so as to prove to those men that it had been my head that was wrong, not my heart. Slowly, fearfully, I made myself take off my clothes, my stockings, my apron, at last my dress and linen. With fumbling, nervous hands, I put on the seaman's clothing. The trousers and shirt felt stiff, heavy, like some skin, not my own. My bare toes curled upon the wooden floor. I stood some while to question my heart. Zachariah's words to Fisk, that I had been the very soul of justice, echoed within me. I stepped out of my cabin and crept through the steerage. It was drawn. To some distant east, I could see the thinnest edge of sun. All else remained dark. I moved to the galley, praying I would meet no one before I reached it. For once my prayers were answered. I was not noticed, and Fisk was working at the stove. I paused at the doorway. Mr. Fisk, I whispered. He straightened up, turned, saw me. I had at least the satisfaction of his surprise. I've come, I managed to say, to be one of the crew. 